para conducir este primer bloque en esta mesa 1 sobre competiciones Santi Serrat, de nuevo, Santi Serrat en Joan Porcar Joan Porcar, complete muy profile uh, pilot of uh, pilotos, cars motorcycles, además, pioneer president of Indescat in the industry de of sports deporte, favor, so, eh, Joan Porcar and round table number one the organization of uh, open or monotype uh, competition the organization of uh, uh, boats, economic costs. Is it necessary to uh, identify a new economic model, diversification of the fleet? Why official uh, racing teams are getting farther away from private teams? And we have also two organizers, Pierre Bojic, Uh, coming from Paris. He is uh, the general director of Penduic, as you can see in this uh, 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 brochure. He has been organizing the Figaro, Transat, uh, the Bretagne, with a wide experience in the organization of uh, uh, ocean racing. And we also have Javier Alonso, the general director of the Department of Events in Dorna Sport. Thank you, Javier. Uh, they are specialized in the organization of uh, races like Open Moto GP, Moto 2, and Moto 3. So, Santi, let's start with you. Go ahead. Well, uh, I want to uh, explain uh, what uh, Lucien Bourdet was saying. Uh, So, and the important uh, changes in the rule refers, first of all, to the keels. Mm, the keels are going to be in steel, in stainless, stainless steel monoblock, and the masts are going to be uh, built with the same mold. But we don't know exactly what type of mast it's going to be, and we don't know whether it will be the classical rigging with the riggers, uh, with uh, um, or, the, or with uh, a, a different design. I mean, masts and keels um, refer to the data we explained before, and these were the black holes in terms of safety. And then the stability rules uh, have changed. The 10 degree rule has also changed. It was a test that was done uh, in the harbor and, and with uh, water. Mm, so and we had all the material, the sails, and the healing of the boat should not uh, go beyond 10 degrees. Okay, uh, so and then there is a capsizing uh, angle, it's something we do at the harbor, we incline the boat and uh, after this threshold the uh, boat capsizes. Before it was 110 degrees, now it's 114, so the uh, boat will be able to heal more than 90 degrees, 110, and 114 is a bit more. It means that if the boat has the mast in the water, it should be able to go back up straight again, okay? Uh, Mm, and so we have here uh, mm, uh, contribution, mm, and now Mr. Bojic can um, give us uh, his opinion later, but Joan, please. Uh, yes, uh, we are uh, here together, people from the motor racing and sail racing, and that is uh, because we depend so much on technology that we have the same problems. Uh, in, in fact, uh, um, I realize that the problems in sailing and motor racing are the same. In the basic categories, there is a certain technological equality because there were monotypes. Uh, we have been experimenting in uh, Olympic races, etc. And then it was the same in motor. In automobile racing, uh, we had uh, um, uh, the, the f Formula in England were 
where all the cars were the same in order to reduce cost and uh, let the, the pilot out, uh, stand out. And so it is the same. And motorcycles was uh, something very similar. So what has complicated things is when we have been growing in categories and then we have the brand names, the designers, the constructors, and there it was difficult to control the capacity for technological equality. And in each one of these specialities, we had very boring seasons. We had one brand with a huge difference compared with the others, and we couldn't uh, equalize that unless we change the regulations, and that's what we are doing. So the base of sports lies in equality. If there is inequality, the show is not very attractive. So, and going back uh, to this unification of uh, motor and sailing, there has been a very good work, but a difficult work, for example, in the amateur uh, sailing races where uh, handicaps have been added with coefficients, ratings, and so on. So this uh, has become a bit more uh, uh, equalized, but in the end there is always a certain imbalance. And so what we see in the um, uh, car races or motor um, motorcycle races or sailing is to create the products which are as equal as possible for the benefit of the show, and then the technology also has to improve, and the priority is to the pilot, to the, to the sports person, because if the technology is too uh, developed, um, I remember the statements of Nikki Lauda, who said uh, that uh, that a monkey could drive a Formula One. Of course, I mean, it was an exaggeration, but it meant that the technology had advanced so much that we didn't need so many experts anymore. But, uh, I mean, sports uh, are for people, not for technology only. I mean, uh, so the problems are very common, although in the end the applications are different. Okay, uh, um, Mr. Bojic, which is the great difference in um, terms of the organization of a monotype or an open regatta uh, uh, sailing race in these international sailing events? Um, well, first of all, I uh, want to say that I only know sailing. I don't know motor sports. But there is something which is very important, and it is that sailing, it's a mechanical sport. People don't know, uh, but uh, it is a mechanical sport. That's the parallel between motor sports and sailing sports. And, but I think that's as far as it goes and now. Uh, concerning this comparison between open and monotype racing, this is a dilemma that we uh, have seen uh, throughout history. Uh, to me, mm, uh, the origin of ocean racing started in 1960 with uh, four people who went from the UK to the US. And this was uh, organized mm, and based on, uh, on the uh, on the courage of the people. But what is unique about sailing is uh, the values, the values uh, which refer to adventure, to performance, to innovation. And uh, this is what gives value, what adds value to sports. It is not a sport for the large public, but it is a sport for the media. And that's how things were born. And what is interesting is that in, in the beginning, mm, the races uh, mm, uh, were first proposed, and then the boats were built for the race. I remember Penduik uh, from Eric Tavarli, and I uh, was following the, evolu the evolution of uh, this uh, 
races. And uh, Tavarli designed a boat uh, responding to the conditions he was going to confront, to be confronted with in the Pacific race, for example. So what uh, what was most important was the human adventure of a person confronted with the ocean, and that's how the, this huge, his, uh, these huge uh, performances were developed. And, and then, after the 80s, uh, the question is still the same. I mean, after a, a race, we ask ourselves in the debriefing. Uh, what are the reactions? And one of the normal reaction is, and, and I, I think and that is uh, something to be expected, is the safety concerns. So when uh, we uh, are concerned about safety, I think we are making a good uh, uh, good progress uh, for everyone, and so the the uh, seafarers, the sailors, the sailing community benefits from it. And the economic uh, question is not the best criteria because the economic uh, um, limitations do not provide good responses. So, but the question of safety was very useful. And, and we had problems with the keel, with the masts, and, and the uh, uh, architects look for solutions. And um, uh, I think nobody has the ideal solution because we have tested monotypes, we have tested open uh, uh, boats, etc., open class boats, and why? Because technology keeps evolving. And one of the most important things from my point of view is that this sport makes uh, things evolve according to the innovation. And if there are many sponsors in ocean sailing races, it's because in terms of internal and external communication, there is this important value of innovation. Innovation is uh, paramount. And I think that uh, mono, uh, monotypes limit innovation. So there should be a certain monotyping, but with a room for innovation. I mean, for example, in Beneteau, we see how this uh, model was fixed uh, for 10 years. And why did we go from Figaro 1 to Figaro 2? It's because when we saw the evolution in the other classes, it was a, 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 a problem to see that this boat was limited in the way of optimizing its performances. So to answer your question, I think that this sport uh, for the sponsors, for the financial community, for the investors, for, for the donors, and, and all the sailing categories offer incredible amount of possibilities for internal and external communication and they can find in the different categories of uh, boats and, and adventures the category that is more suitable, more adapted to them. So the important thing about our sport is that it, it, it offers a wide uh, range of possibilities um, for uh, um, uh, uh, for attraction for, of uh, in public interest and fundraising. So, and the other aspect is that uh, an ocean sailing race is not going from A to B. It is the idea of sailing through uh, the ocean. And of course, we are in different economic cycles, uh, and the different skippers press on the organizers to. Uh, um, to adapt the races to the circumstances. And, and we had the Imoca class. In other times, we had the Orma, like the multi-hulls, uh, 60 feet open. 
to you know, reserve um, such and such race to a certain type of boats. For example, La Route de Rome, uh, it was a, a solo sailing race, very famous in France, and the original principle was the freedom and it was multi-class, uh, totally open, going ranging from 14 meters uh, to any kind of overall length. And this contributed first to an incredible uh, success. We have about two million people attending uh, the departure in Saint Malo, an incredible uh, interest uh, over the media and and uh, business community, etc. And because we kept the original idea, if we would have changed the original idea, the success wouldn't have been the same. Now, to summarize what I'm saying, I think that each test should keep the original idea, and then they have to uh, manage between open and monotype in a way that doesn't go to either extreme, because there is an industry uh, behind our sport, the same as it happens with the automobile or, or motorcycle sport, which is a formidable laboratory for experimentation and progress. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Bojic. And now we go to the uh, motor racing, motorcycle racing. Uh, motor racing is open, Moto2 is uh, free with a uh, Honda engine, and 3 is KTM, uh, uh, Honda, and Mahindra. Now, what uh, did these new categories uh, provide to these, and why the official teams are so far ahead from the private teams? How to manage to have less differences and how to limit the budget? So, Javier, you have the floor. Well, first of all, Mm, we have a problem for several years, and that is when we had the category of 250 cubic centimeters, and, and there was always the same winner, Aprilia, and then two or three more. And in order to solve this problem, we changed the category of 250 to and a half. And uh, we went to a new one with a free uh, chassis, but with uh, a fixed, uh, fixed engines, uh, fixed petrol, fixed tires. So we had a few technology innovation uh, here, but and, and this is the fourth year in this category. After uh, these four years, the chassis are uh, almost the same. Sometimes they start with one uh, uh, frame and they uh, change it uh, to another one, and the results are exactly the same. The uh, pilots uh, race on the basis of their own skills and and based on the on the skills of the team. So it's working very well now. We are now continuing for three more years. Now we have a new company in Aragon, and the frames, the chassis will be the same. Uh, the price is the same. The price is reasonable. There is no competition. So we are very happy now with the result. What we have now is that any team, in principle, can uh, uh, compete to be uh, the leader. And, of course, last year, uh, Marquez was uh, um, <laughs> uh, very dominant, but sometimes we have pilots who go to the first positions, and this helps the sponsors and the teams to participate. In Moto3, we have looked for a different solution because uh, having so much limitation uh, is uh, uh, mm, uh, good if there are more participants and more manufacturers. So thanks to the difficult technical regulations, well, now we have three manufacturers who are with us. 
We have prepared a change of the regulations for 2014 and another one for 2015 in order to minimize the changes uh, from the different brands. I mean, right now, KTM is dominating Honda, and we are trying to look for changes so that this is not always so. I mean, if we do not uh, succeed, then we would go to a single engine. I mean, but right now, we are trying to avoid that. And in MotoGP, it's, uh, well, the top of the competition, so we give as much freedom as possible, although we limit uh, certain aspects, like the tires, which is uh, Bridgestone, uh, and now we are working also on the shock absorbers to uh, uh, minimize the uh, electronic suspensions controlled with uh, a CPU, etc., which do not add to the show or to the evolution of the motorcycle. So we are minimizing the freedom in, in uh, suspension and brakes. And we'll have a new regulation in 2017. We are discussing this with Honda, with Ducati and Yamaha with the intention of having uh, a more uniformity. We understand that uh, these teams will always be at the top, no matter uh, how much regulations we have. You have the engineers, and they, they have the obligation of uh, going beyond the rules. I mean, we put the rules, and the engineers uh, almost break them, no? I mean, and uh, I was talking with Stefano Dominicali of Ferrari, and he was telling me that uh, when they froze the evolution of the engines in Formula One, they went from having many uh, mechanical engineers to having chemical engineers to analyze the reaction of gas uh, and, and and combustion. So, and now we have a main idea we are discussing with the teams, and that is that the manufacturers should develop a minimum amount of motorbikes with the same technical specifications. So, they should manufacture, in principle, six motorbikes so that everyone has a right and access to that technology. In this sense, we we are working, uh, controlling also the Superbike World Championship, and we are using the same regulation for 2014 that we have for the same price, the same technology, with the same uh, manufacturer, so that we reach this uniformity in the evolution of motorcycles. And it is very important because in Spain we see many leading pilots and if we have many possibilities of uh, having access to this uh, technology, we'll see pilots from other countries as well. Joan. Um, okay. Uh, and, uh, yes. Uh, Let's talk about innovation. I mean, as Pierre was saying before, and I think the motor racing and the sail racing are similar in this sense, and because the monotypes come from open and development. I mean, the open classes were the classes which introduced technological research, technological risk, and then uh, we developed the different uh, possibilities. For example, Pierre was saying in the Figaro class, out of the evolution of the other classes, and they were forced to change to another monotype. Even Eric Tavarli, the great innovation of Tavarli were produced within an open uh, environment, an open context. I mean, if uh, uh, Tavarli we wouldn't, wouldn't have been in an open environment, we would have different uh, results. For example, the mod uh, 70 were based on the experience of the ORMA, of the ORMA. And then I think in 94 and 96, there were uh, many cup sizes, etc. 
um, and the security we have in, in the Imoca uh, cl uh, class and, 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 and the trimarans we have now are the result of the, all the trimarans which were broken in the Orma class. In the Volvo 65, it is the experience of Volvo uh, 60, Volvo 70, which has led to 65, uh, Volvo 65. So with all of these monotypes, I mean, how are we going to feed technological innovation if we restrict the open category? Well, in, in, in our, the evolution is in MotoGP. Moto2 and Moto3, it's a show. And, and what we have is good pilots to identify good pilots so that they can go to MotoGP. But uh, the innovation takes place in MotoGP, okay? That's our intention. Uh, in Moto2 and Moto3, we develop pilots. I mean, I remember when we were racing with 500 cc's of two-stroke, uh, well, 500 cc two-stroke to have the same race in, in Jerez, for for example, they uh, used 34 liters for 45, uh, 45 minutes race. Now we have 21 liters and, and with double the, the capacity in cc's, in 1,000 cc's. So Moto2 and Moto3, we uh, develop pilots. Mm, okay, so mm, do, did you understand the concept of uh, Pierre where we respond to a concept, the organization? Yes, yes, I fully agree. Uh, let me say something. Well, the world is changing and the world is changing very rapidly for good and for bad. And there is a very personal appreciation Mm, I believe uh, that we are not realizing that technology, mm, mm, well, society and those who are in this uh, technological world has reached a point in which we do not need much more to live well and to have a good show, a good spectacle. I mean, remember that the Concorde plane is not flying anymore, and we wanted to go faster from Europe to America. But maybe with uh, six to eight hours is enough. We don't need to shorten it if it is economic, if it is comfortable, and if it is safe. Uh, so concepts like this, um, which uh, lead to an important uh, reflection. For example, in the world of motorcycle, the Superbike World Championship, I mean, motorcycles which uh, derive from the series, I mean, it's, it's not like MotoGP, it's, it's a series. Do we need a lot more performance to have show? No. No, mm -mm. I mean, and, uh, of course we can compare between superbikes and, and GP. And superbikes uh, sometimes are more interesting than MotoGP, but the audience uh, um, commands and, and, and the great pilots are in MotoGP. And that's why in Spain we have four million people in, in audience in MotoGP. And we have 400,000 in superbikes. Of course, we can't compare the audience with the, with the race. I mean, in, in Aragon, we had 15,000 people in the circuit. And for GP, we have 65,000 people. I mean, so what, what we have to manage is to understand what is our sport. And once we understand our sport, we should evolve. In Spain, 20 years ago, we didn't have pilots. You remember what we saw uh, 20 years ago with British, Italian pilots. Now we have eight Spanish pilots, and people say, oh, that's a disaster. Well, I remember where there were eight American pilots, and nobody complained. I mean, we have to find the uh, uh, evolution and, and, and the innovation 
competition and the people who make every sport uh, big. Well, I agree, but maybe, mm, uh, I mean, for a long time, for many years, the technology has evolved so much that we were uh, surprised every day. But sometimes, I mean, I, I, I'm just playing the ad, uh, devil's advocate here, but uh, it is a contradiction to see that we are trying with the regulations to put a break on technology. So what we do is to make sport more expensive. With, uh, 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 if we have a um, motor of 3,000 cc and we admit a 5,000 cc engine, it is cheaper and it gives the same performance. I mean, uh, the fact of fine tuning the technology has made us lose the, the reality. And now, talking about the philosophy of the organizations, I think that all sports events, all the organizations, organizations uh, should have a very clear philosophy and the essence of any activity is that uh, in order not to lose the, the north, uh, we, have, we need to stick to the original idea, as Pierre was saying. And like the Route de Rum, for example, was a wonderful race, and they didn't have to change much to continue being successful. I mean, it's like I say, well, we have to evolve. Yes, but uh, Coca-Cola has been 100 years being the same. So, I mean, the concept of uh, sticking to the original philosophy is very important. Okay, questions from the newspaper. But, Mr. Bojic, do you prefer to have an international fleet? And do you want to have the best, only the best, only or the largest number? Uh, whom do you prefer? So, I will answer your question, but I want to comment something. <laughs> Uh, yes. Um, so I, w I will talk about technology because uh, concerning the sailing, I, uh, I do not agree with you. Um, uh, now, um, what do I want as an organizer? Well, um, what we have to do is, first of all, to organize a sports event which has a true value, a sports event which responds to the objective we want to achieve. We had a race, sailing races uh, with 80 uh, um, 85 boats in five classes, uh, and five different categories, and we also had races with eight boats, you know. Uh, of course, uh, we want to have many participants, but what is important is to have a very strong concept, uh, very clear values, uh, so that we find them in different editions, and so that it is uh, a good uh, uh, a good goal for. Uh, for for everybody. For example, everybody wants to uh, be in the Barcelona World Race, in the Vendée Globe, in the Route de Rome, and each one has its own goal. They imagine their uh, project. They go and uh, look for sponsors, etc. So what I want to do is to have a quality, attractive sports event, attractive for the public and for the sports people. Uh, 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 like uh, people say, I want to win the Barcelona World Race, uh, Van de Globe, uh, the Route de Ram. It has to be popular because um, the best recognition we can have is to have a popular hundreds of thousands of people who uh, want to see this sailing boat and then a media event because the objective is that it has to have a good rest. And now I want to uh, comment on uh, innovation and technology. I think that concerning sailing boats, uh, it is fundamental to uh, leave a freedom to research, to innovation, to invention, to inventivity. Why? 
because if you imagine the root, the ram, and uh, they, uh, they, it lasted for 24 days in the beginning, today they do it in seven days. The first one, the globe, the, the, they, made, they went around the world in hundred and something days. Now they go in less than 80 days. And of course, what has allowed this is the innovation uh, on the boats, and it is in the human nature to uh, um, want to go uh, a little bit further, so, and that is innovation. And talking about our subject, um, every time that we have tried to limit uh, either uh, with monotypes or with uh, restrictive ratings, there are skippers which went around the regulation, which broke the regulation in a legal way, if you want. I mean, when we say we are going to limit the size of the boat, and said, ah, okay, if it is like this, we're going to go and race uh, everywhere else, and we're going to do the record of the, of the Atlantic or the Jules Verne. And this is uh, extraordinary because the response to a limitation, to a restriction on, in freedom has uh, this reaction, this human mm, reflex action, which tells me, mm, don't, uh, don't limit me. I'm going to go beyond. Okay, let's uh, go to the next tack. Uh, let's, uh, do you have uh, questions? We have two questions here. Mm, uh, please, uh, your name in media, Enrique Kurt, uh, from Kurt uh, Publishing Company, Skipper and, uh, and Regatta Magazine. I think that in the ocean uh, sailing and race, it's uh, evolving to uh, television and media circus, the Vendée Globe uh, was uh, very lucky to have this magnificent cocktail this year. Uh, they didn't have a winner 24 hours bef before uh, the arrival. They had accidents. They broke the mast in the uh, French world of sailing. It is very important also what is a skipper, what is the effort to go into the Vendée Globe. So all of this cocktail makes it very, very uh, interesting and with a huge media uh, follow-up. So, but what I see is that this uh, large freedom in design can um, uh, take us to a Vendée Globe uh, with uh, a very experienced skipper who uh, everybody knows who is going to be. Uh, so uh, instead of having two participants um, reaching at the same time, we, we should have six, you know. And so the uh, answer uncertainty of the winner gives it a, a far greater interest to the competition. So the competition depends very much on the boat and on, on their luck, etc. Okay. Uh, unless uh, there is an UFO, you know, landing on top of the boat. So but uh, because there are no regulations which can prevent this. So what I believe is um, that uh, we are evolving in sailing uh, towards the Formula One in cars or in, or in motorcycle racing. So it's more of a media uh, show, limiting parameters, so that uh, at the arrival we have uh, mm, uh, a, a few possible winners. So. I think we should limit the technology to improve the, uh, the, the struggle for victory, you know. I think if instead of two participants we would have had six candidates to victory, it would have been much, much better. So anyway, um, 
And I think that the, uh, the follow-up at the time of the, of the cap size really increased the audience, you know. So, of course, a bit of uh, suffering increases the, um, the audience. So, I think in this sense, uh, um, it's good to give a good coverage. Uh, well, uh, Barcelona World Race also has uh, improved the audience. So, Mr. Bojic, could you give us a comment on this? Uh, yes, I, I think um, I understood what you meant, but, uh, I, and of course, uh, I see the example of the Figaro Race, for example. Um, in the Figaro, all the boats are the same, and uh, the technology there is uh, limited, and the boats reach all um, the same, uh, more or less uh, at the same time, in between Bretagne, Brest, and the Martinique. In three weeks, they are all there, and of course, they, they are all there at the same time. But I am not sure that this gives more media interest. And secondly, I am not sure that this is one of the main reasons to have all of them together. And, and uh, 1998, in the road uh, run, they had a monohull with uh, uh, 22 meters and, and, and a trimaran of 15 meters. And they and, and reach with uh, uh, 98 seconds of difference. I mean, and after uh, uh, crossing the Atlantic, I mean, a 22 monohull, 22 meter long monohull with a 15 meter trimaran. But I don't know uh, what uh, could improve the audience. I mean when we have this kind of thing. So, honestly, I do not think that the limitation of the technology is going to be an element which will allow us to be more present in the media. Nicolas from the ABC. I'm oh, sorry, uh, Javier, uh, Javier so a question. And first um, of all, the motorcycles which uh, substituted uh, uh, Moto3, for example, the previous motorcycles have been recycled to other championships. And the second question is, is uh, possible to recycle the Moto3 so that it, it becomes competitive? Well, the old 125, um, they, they cease to exist. There is a minor a championship uh, here uh, in, I mean, a Mediterranean championship, but they, they, they don't exist anymore because they uh, stopped to they stopped manufacturing. So, and and the second question, which was. Uh, Ah, uh, yes. Well, um, well, someone tried to use the frame of 125 in, in Moto3, but it didn't work. But, I mean, a frame of a Moto3, I mean, it's, uh, it's about 80,000 euros for the whole season. So, you know, it's not... Okay. So Kiko Cusi, although Suso Garcia, well, uh, uh, well, in... Uh, in 250 cc's, Aprilia uh, was dominating. Yeah, but in the last year, Honda won. Okay, uh, Suso and Kiko, last questions before going to the social networks. Yes, I wanted to ask whether the economic cycles are related to what we are saying. I mean, if we would be in an expansive world cycle, uh, would it make sense that the large competitions would have a box rule or open? Uh, because since we are now in a depressive or recessive um, cycle, um, is there a relationship? Uh, 
Uh, it, does it make sense that during the recession uh, there is more monotype to uh, in, increase the number of participation and vice versa? And to Javier Alonso, I wanted to ask, since there is a direct relationship between technology show and audience, the nationality of the pilots in, in your case uh, is important. Suso Perez, La Vanguardia. Well, the nationality is important, uh, but, uh, for example, in track and field, uh, you have Jamaica, you know, and nobody says, why do, does Jamaica get all the, all the medals, you know? And, and now, of course, in Spain, we promoted this uh, because there were many companies manufacturing motorcycles here, so, and that's why they got the support for many years, and now they are present in all the races. But it's true that in the expansive cycle, there were a series of sponsors. Uh, for example, we had many uh, tobacco companies uh, sponsoring um, because they, in, uh, they managed to increase the price of motorcycles. And, but the, it became uh, a point where the motorcycles were too expensive. Now, instead of tobacco companies, uh, if uh, mm, the sponsors would pay the same price, probably we would have more freedom, but it's not the reality. I mean, we don't have the sponsors we had 12 years ago. So we have to look for formula so that everyone can compete at the same level. I remember, for example, when Cito Pons was in GP, he had a private team which could be the leader. If, uh, but today he couldn't be competitive because nobody would sell the motorcycle uh, to him. I mean, so today everyone should have the possibility to be competitive to enlarge the, the possibilities for everyone. And, and, but is it important, the nationality, in terms of the show? I mean, uh, in terms of the audience? I mean, if we have a, a Dutch pilot, is it easy to sell it to Holland? Yes, yes, no doubt. Uh, we'll sell it better in Holland. But we have uh, met pilots which are transcultural. Uh, I mean, uh, for example, Valentino Rossi, um, when Spain was winning all the races, is still selling 50% of the merchandising in, in Spain. So Valentino Rossi is important not only in Italy, but for the rest of the world. Today, we see uh, uh, another cross-cultural star, which is Mark Marquez. Mark, I mean, is a person who has a uh, fans club outside of Spain, which is bigger than that of other Spanish pilots in Spain. Uh, and, and in the camera, in the media, uh, he shines uh, brighter. And, but of course, if we would have pilots from other countries, we would uh, reach better. For example, Dorna has made a series of works in these years. For example, Stefan Bradl, we have helped him from birth. Casey Stoner is another pilot. Uh, well, now he's uh, retired, but uh, um, we uh, trained him together with Alberto Puig to reach the point he's in now. Okay, Kiko Cusi, before going to Maria Bertrand from the social networks, uh, because the social networks are also following this debate. Okay, as a personal opinion, uh, I think it's different motor and sailing, um, because 
In sailing, there is an adventure, which is not an aspect of adventure, which is not present in motor. So I think it's important to keep the open uh, formula, uh, because it's not only a matter of who is going to win. I mean, in the last Van de Globe, we saw an open race with three boats, which were monotypes and one broke the keel, but otherwise uh, they would have been the three winners. But then we had Alessandro Di Benedetto, and Alessandro Di Benedetto, if we would have had monotype, would have been too expensive for him. So I want to know the opinion of the two organizers here. Um, can you combine uh, somehow an open class with um, mini monotype fleets with it the same regatta, the same race? Uh, yes, very quickly. Uh, um, uh, I think that a good example in the world of motor uh, racing um, is Dakar. Uh, uh, you have elite pilots, elite uh, brands with private uh, competitors which combine with each other and there is room for everybody. Uh, so I think in, in, sail, in sailing it, it is close to this because there is the factor of adventure in the Dakar. Of course, it's very different between boys or in the desert, I mean, long distance, or, for example, uh, uh, in ocean racing, you know, or, or raid rally uh, uh, competition, you know. So, but they have uh, things in common, but we have to separate the specialities because Mm, because you have uh, and the ocean or the desert and long distances compared with boys and uh, and a circuit, no? Yeah, it's complicated. I mean, um, what uh, happens in motorcycling, um, and what we have tried with Moto3 and Moto2 is to give the possibility to any pilot to compete and to show that they are capable of uh, riding a bike at a very high competitive level. If you show this with a, a small budget in Moto3, then you can go to Moto2, and finally you can go to MotoGP, where you have total freedom. Uh, and when we change from two and a half to uh, Moto2, they criticized us, saying that we were killing the competition, that the pilots wouldn't learn with uh, Moto2, uh, where the frame is uh, very similar and the motor, the engine is the same. And we have seen that uh, there was a, a boy going from Moto2 to MotoGP, and he already won MotoGP in the second race. I mean, that's why we have three categories. Well, we have others, but in the World Championship, we have three categories with this objective. Yes, in sailing, now we have the road de rum. Road de rum is the best answer. I mean, in the same race, we have uh, multi hulls which are 34 meter uh, length, and then uh, they, you have 12 meter mono hulls competing with each other. So you can uh, combine it all, but you have to define the spirit of the race. Okay, Maria. Now, from Facebook or Twitter, are there any questions for Santi, Juan, Pierre, Javier? Yes, well, first of all, if we don't have time, we can do it later through the web. But uh, there is a question for Santi. Saying, when the Im IMOCA 60 will participate in a, a race where all of them have the same keels and the same masts. Well, this is for the new boats, okay? 
and uh, and this has to be specified. I mean, the technical committee has to say what type of mast, how will be the keel, um, but the new boats with this new uh, regulation, so, but the, uh, the race in this year uh, and have to, unless someone knows better, have to um, continue with the old uh, uh, ratings and uh, and the next year we'll have new rules for for the ne for the new boats. That's all I know. Yeah, uh, I am not uh, a specialist, uh, but um, the, res the answer is clear. The objective is fixed uh, for the next Van de Globe. So all the boats, I mean the boats that are going to be built, will have to respect these new rules and uh, the boats which exist today will be able to adapt or the old boats will have certain tolerance rate. But the objective is the Vendée Globe 2016 to uh, comply with these new regulations. Okay, so we finish with the first round table. Thank you, Javier Alonso, for attending um, here in the Center of Ocean Interpretation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bojic, for coming from Paris. Uh, so thank you very much.